Many listeners and viewers have asked me the uh, classic question about fear of anesthesia. What do I do to get over the fear of anesthesia? So I wanted to answer a couple of those today on this live stream so that you guys can also watch this in the future. And if you're having surgery, use some of these tips to have less fear. And starting first, you know, one in four patients has some fear of general anesthesia to the point where they're going to postpone their elective surgeries. I, I don't know if you knew this, but that's a very, very high number. And I want you to first off know that you're definitely not alone. Uh, I get the first couple comments coming in. After my mega colectomy surgery, they gave me an epidural and they numbed me in my belly area. Do you do those? Yes, we do. So Jason Walsh is asking about epidurals. Totally we do those and it helps numb up a lot of the pain for many types of thoracic and abdominal surgeries, including colectomies. So, uh, very good question. Hey to everyone who's coming on, especially Heidi, Ella, Susan, Darian. Hey, hey everyone. So fear of anesthesia and not waking up. So you come on the operating room table, you get the mask going over your face, right? And that can definitely incite some fear and anxiety in patients. I totally get it. You're not alone. Like we said, one in four patients might postpone their surgery just from the general anesthesia fear alone. This is a little loose here. Hold on, let me tighten my uh, tripod. Okay, so how do you come over your fear? <laughs> I wish there was a one-size-fits-all answer, but straight up, there's not gonna be one-size-fits-all like everything else in medicine. It's a little nuanced, but I want you to take away at least one trick from this because if you can get over your fear of surgery, like an operating room here, and anesthesia, you're one step closer to overcoming your fears from anything else in life as well. The same skills translate to other parts of life. It's not just like, I could come over my, get over my fear of spiders, I won't be able to get over my fear of surgery. There's a lot of overlap. All right, uh, a lot of great comments coming in. Uh, Linda, good to see you. Oh, she's asking about Sugamidex. Um, unfortunately, I've already locked this um, drawer here, but I have Sugamidex in the medication part of that drawer. It's to reverse rocuronium and vecuronium. Good question to help reverse paralysis. Uh, okay, and AW says MH here. Do you have malignant hyperthermia? You know, we have, I guess we have, here we go. Malignant hyperthermia is all over the operating room because it is like the number one big um, issue with anesthesia. So if anyone, <laughs> To be very clear, our first thing about fear of anesthesia is knowing the risks and the numbers. The numbers alone don't help alleviate fears because it's like that's a brain analytical thing and fear is a very visceral kind of mind, body, soul thing, right? But it does help to know that things like malignant hyperthermia, the poster that I just showed you, affects very, very, very few patients. And that's the real anesthesia allergy that can have probably the most dangerous thing you can go to sleep with if it's undiagnosed. If we know you have malignant hyperthermia, we do the anesthesia totally differently to make that risk much, much lower. So point number one is that if you're afraid of anesthesia, afraid of not waking up, be reassured that unless you have malignant hyperthermia, you're not at any high risk of having an anesthesia allergy per se. Other medications can cause allergic reactions, but the most dangerous one is gonna be malignant hyperthermia. Once again, almost every operating room We'll have a poster like this on here that goes through all the emergency steps and the MH hotline up here so that we can make sure it gets treated quickly. So that's the fact for one. Number two fact is that if you're healthy and you're having a routine elective surgery, the risk of not waking up and not making an office operating room table is incredibly low. It's low enough that I don't even know what the number is. It's just so rare in modern times with modern... <clears throat> anesthesia medications, you know, ventilators, breathing tubes, you don't, it is a very rare numerically incidence. Medications like propofol have totally transformed anesthesia from things like ether and other stuff that was used 50, 60 years ago. Uh, can I give you an exact number? No, because you have a specific medical history, a specific surgery type, specific anesthesia type, etc. But in general, if your heart and lungs are healthy enough such that you can climb up two flights of stairs without chest pain or trouble breathing, your body is more or less physically ready to undergo anesthesia. Got it? Two flights of stairs. That is one of our 
heuristics, one of our basic rule of thumbs to see, do you need to get a stress test? Do you need an echocardiogram or something? If you can walk up two flights of stairs without chest pain or troubled breathing, your body can likely tolerate anesthesia, whether it be propofol, gases, opioids, ketamine, etominate, whatever. Okay, let's get into the deeper stuff though. If, when you're afraid of something, <clears throat> what happens to your body? M many things happen. They stem from your brain activating your sympathetic nervous system, which is your flight or fright response, right? And time and time again, you may not know this, but it has been shown that we can adjust our fear levels in part by adjusting our sympathetic nervous system. This is crazy because it means that if you can get a hold of your sympathetic nervous system, for example, techniques that can lower your heart rate, help reduce your sweating, your anxious sweating, things that ultimately come around, come <clears throat> uh, revolve around you controlling your autonomic nervous system, controlling the nerves in your body, you actually can reduce your fear as well. If not fully, at least a chunk of it. And the cool thing here is that you don't necessarily need medications to do that. Sometimes I will use IV medications called beta blockers. Beta blockers are what we can use to help reduce PTSD because of the hyper arousal that beta blocker <clears throat> that PTSD pardon brings up when we're reliving traumatic experiences, beta blockers can crush that sympathetic nervous system surge. They lower your heart rate. They literally calm your body down and help reduce the fear that you're feeling. If I have a very anxious patient, I may give a little bit of beta blocker, right? Uh, that helps reduce the nervous system. You can do the same thing with your breathing control. I have so many videos on this, I won't go through all of it now, but my five in, five out technique paired with biofeedback on the monitor as the patient is falling asleep on the table is super, super powerful. In fact, I'm gonna turn the monitor on right now and just I'll do a quick demo for you. I do this with patients as they're in the pre-op area, if they're nervous or anxious or afraid, so that they can begin to get their Anxiety under control and controlling anxiety typically gets the fear better under control as well. Okay, number three, exposure therapy. So while that monitor is getting warmed up, and I'll connect myself just with the pulse ox so you can see how I control my heart rate with it, I'm going to tell you about exposure therapy because this is also non-pharmaceutical and very powerful. And it's kind of what we're doing right now. You're in an operating room. You're being exposed to the fearful situation. Exposure on its own cannot crush fear, but if you are controlling your sympathetic nervous system and being exposed, now you are exposing yourself to a fearful situation, but you have more control over that situation. I'm going to say that one more time because it's so darn powerful. And by the way, guys, none of these comments popped up. <laughs> oh my gosh, I missed all of these comments. Um, oh boy. <laughs> wow, there's so many comments. Uh, let me see what else did we miss. Um, well, let me finish what I'm saying about fear, uh, exposure, and the anxiety control with breathing, and then we'll get to all your questions. Sorry about this. I, none of them popped up on my uh, <laughs> my on my on my uh, feed here. Operating tour, excellent. We'll do a little operating tour. So um, let's go back to what I was going to show. <laughs> Heidi, I know there's so many questions that came and I didn't see any of them. Um, uh, and we'll talk about spinals as well, Susan. Let me explain this because everyone having surgery or being you know, in any type of phobia situation, claustrophobia, arachnophobia, etc., can benefit from this powerful technique. Exposure plus gaining control over your body whether it's with medications like beta blockers or with your brain itself with the breathing technique. I'm going to briefly demo for you. Uh, so let's bring this a little bit closer to the monitor. So guys, this is like the state of the art kind of life support monitors we use to keep you alive in the operating room. It's not like a Fitbit or an Apple watch. This is what we use when we have you on life support. It's the real deal. So, I'm just going to use one of the monitors. Uh, I've done the EKG so many times. You've seen my heart on echo, on EKG, you know, like I've made my body clear for you guys, right? So this will just be one with the pulse ox. I'm going to put the propofol down for a moment. Can everyone hear my pulse ox? Uh, okay. 
Can everyone hear that right now? Uh, hey, Linda, I don't know why. Uh, I owe you a question, by the way, Linda. It is coming up um, on Video MD. I got your um, question. I will answer it, by the way. Uh, so everyone can hear my heartbeat. Does everyone hear my heart rate changing? Does everyone hear how it speeds up and it slows down? You can actually see, you can see on there the waves of my, my actual, the pulse in my finger and you can hear. Hey Ella, thanks for the kind comments. So what have I done right now? I have gained control over a situation that is scary that I'm exposing myself to. Okay, it's not just exposure therapy, it's not just control, it's contextually applying control over your body, over your heart, your lungs, your diaphragm, all these muscles that, you know, I was originally taught that the autonomic nervous system, you cannot control. I'm showing you right now that you, you can control without medications. You hear it because this is, this is me. If you want proof, I take it off, it goes away behind me, right? So this is biofeedback. I'm controlling my heart rate. I'm controlling my heart rate variability. And I'm exposing y'all to an operating room. There's the lights, there's the operating room table, there's the ventilator, the anesthesia machine, the monitors, and your anesthesiologist, all right? So this is how you can overcome uh, one other powerful tool in your toolbox. You know the rational numbers, you know what the area looks like, you have experience in controlling your body, putting these all together, now you're building a toolbox to overcome even some of the most fearful situations. Of course, there's benzodiazepines, there's the medications that I give in acute fear, acute hyperarousal, of course, I'll use these when necessary. But you don't have access to these before you come into the pre-op area, before you get your IV, etc. And when you can control your fear and anxiety after surgery, the fewer opioids you need, the fewer pain medications you need, the fewer complications you're at risk for, the less uh, chance of nausea and other side effects from those pain medications. So you take these long after the operating room for lifelong benefit. Often, like I said, naturally. Of course, you can also augment this with things like aromatherapy to make the breathing techniques more powerful. I'm gonna take this off, by the way. It's getting <laughs> kind of annoying. Uh, of course, you can use gentle botanicals like valerian root, uh, theanine, melatonin, and all sorts of other natural supplements you can use to augment what you're already doing. And you can do those <clears throat> typically after surgery. You always wanna to talk to your doctor first, of course, before you start any supplement. For my patients, it's a combination, or it's not just one or the other, it's combining the best of natural, the best of pharmaceutical uh, medications. So if you can take any one of those elements away, you will have stand, you'll send a much better, uh, much better chance. And number four is support. And I'll end with this one, then we'll get to all of your questions here, because support is something that everyone thinks is just like a you know, hippy dippy, like, oh, you have a support structure. It's like, hey, when you're in a stressful situation, inside an operating room, right? Or outside an operating room. Your support, knowing that you can trust your doctors, your loved ones who are gonna be taking care of you after surgery, all of those together help make that memory more likely to be a normal memory in your brain versus a PTSD memory. Support, behind one of the reasons behind adverse childhood experiences, behind PTSD, remember betrayal can cause PTSD, but it's really betrayal of people that we should be trusting that is most likely to cause us emotional pain, emotional damage, and promote more fear as opposed to reducing fear. So with that said, let's catch up on lots of questions. You guys had great questions and I did not see them come in. Okay, so what is malignant hyperthermia? It is the major uh, anesthesia allergy where anesthesia medications like succinylcholine, which I don't have on me to show you, but I can actually show you the label for it, just to proof that it's a real medication, succinylcholine here, see this? This medication or anesthesia gases like sevoflurane here, I turn it on by turning the knob here, by the way. 
those cause all of your muscles to go into rapid contraction, causing hyperthermia. It's like all your muscles are working out at once, your body temperature goes up, your carbon dioxide level goes up, your blood acidity uh, skyrockets, you get lower pH, more acidic, um, and that's why we use dantrolene. Oh! Still no? We vomited. That's kind of an issue. All right, yeah. I'll be right there then. Is that cool? Yeah. Should, we, should I prepare a shot? Or? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So with that said, everyone, we are going, uh, I need to go and take care of something now, but uh, I hope you all learned uh, a little bit. <laughs> we have more questions to get to. We'll have to get to them next time. But I hope that you appreciated just how much power you have over your body to control things like fear, anxiety, especially in stressful situations like surgery in the operating room. So we're going to go and, uh, well, I'm going to go. <laughs> and I hope to see you guys again soon. I just filmed a video, by the way, that I'm very excited to share with you about emergency situations and why I intentionally labeled the syringe differently, or if you want to call it mislabeled, whatever you want to call it, the code that anesthesiologists use in emergency situations to label syringes like those of epinephrine with propofol labels. I will let you know about that in the next video that I, I just finished filming it um, because there is so much to emergency medicine that I want you guys to learn about because ultimately it's paperwork versus a patient's life. And when you're on the operating room and there's an emergency, I'm not gonna let paperwork get in the way of me saving a patient's life. And if that means temporarily using a different label, well, I'm gonna do that when there are no other alternatives and seconds are at stake between saving a life and doing paperwork appropriately. So nothing against, of course, always you wanna practice the best practices or follow the best practices in medicine, but sometimes you need to also be mindful of the context that an emergency is happening in. And that's why there's never a recipe book for emergencies in medicine. You, we train for years to learn how to adapt all the best practices to the situation at hand including this whole fear discussion. It's not one size fits all, it's what works for you and uh, helps you overcome your fear, whether it's surgery, spiders, or anything else. All right, I hope everyone learned something. I look forward to seeing you guys again soon. Um, as I said before, we're really excited about the clinic that we soft launched this week, harmonyinfusion.com. And you can always ask me more personalized questions on videomd.com and um, Hit that like button and subscribe to keep up with all of my lives. <laughs> I really appreciate your support, everyone. Take care.